You're listening to LA 40 with Katerina Kozias only on LA Talk Radio. We got to get that music going so that we wake up in the morning. The blood's pumping a little bit. Happy Thursday. Welcome back to LA Talk Radio. LA 40 is the show you're tuning into right now. And I'm your host, Katerina Kozias. This is the week of. Independence Day, 4th of July, and I don't know if you're watching us from home or if you happen to be out at the lake somewhere, but it's always a fun time this time of year. I am so excited about today's episode because on the heels of Independence Day, we are going to be talking about living the American dream, and specifically, can you still strive for the American dream if you're living life after 40? Uh, I'm joined right now in studio by my special guest, Ken Craig. And Ken, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's a pleasure Great to be here. Great to have you here this morning. Yeah, a lot of fun. Yes. How did you spend your, uh, well, you had uh, a bunch of personal family things that came up for you. Yeah. You were telling me before the show, uh, uh, you know, for Fourth of July. But we did go. We, we uh, always go to a friend who throws a very big barbecue with lots of people, and everybody sings, everybody performs. Perfect. I didn't. I can't sing. <laughs> <laughs> Managed a lot of singers. Couldn't sing a note. Well, managing a lot of singers, this is one reason we have Ken on the program today. For those of you who may not be familiar with the name Ken Cragen, I promise you that you are going to be familiar with the talent over the years that he has managed. We are talking some of Hollywood's leading acts including Kenny Rogers, Lionel Richie, Olivia Newton-John, Trisha Yearwood, even the Bee Gees for a while, Ken. Yeah. You were responsible literally for guiding the careers of some of the most fabulous talents in the 80s and 90s. Very big privilege and a lot of excitement and a lot of fun. And in most cases, not all of them, I started when they were unknowns, which was very satisfying when you create a career that you know really goes somewhere. and. Mm -hmm and you're part of that success. I, I always felt like we were partners in that success. Their talent and whatever creativity I could bring to it, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, I was very fortunate. How important is passion? You know, it's interesting. I teach a class quite often at UCLA, an undergraduate class, a lot of students, mm -hmm. and I have guests, all kinds of guests, from Quincy Jones to Lionel Richie to David Foster to some incredible music talents and others. And every single guest, no matter what their background is, uses that word. Mm. Everyone says, find your passion, do what you're passionate about, and you'll be successful. Not only will you be happy and, and enjoy what you're doing, you're most likely to be successful that way. And uh, I even spend the first session or two of my class mm -hmm. teaching people how to figure out what they're passionate about, what gives them the most fulfillment, the most enjoyment, uh, the most pleasure. Uh, do you have a couple of tips for us now? Because I know there's a bunch of people watching that are curious, right? How do you find your passion? There's a nice, I just have a kind of a statistical <laughs> way to do it. You, you, you know, you can do it on your computer or you can write it on a pad, but I like to do it on something where you can then prioritize things. Okay. And you basically, what you do is you make out a list on the left hand, it's, it's four quadrants, I call it a personal balance sheet. Mm -hmm. And you, so you split the page in four. In the upper left hand side of the page, you put all the things you like in order of their most important. What is the number one thing that gives you the most pleasure, the most fun, the most enjoyment, and so on down, two, three, four, and you can reprioritize them, prioritize them once you've got them down. Sure. You do the same thing on the opposite side, on the right side with dislikes. What would you most like to avoid? Not want to do. Okay. I know for me it would be social media. <laughs> <Go on. laughs> yeah. But if it's not wanting to get up early in the morning, you're not going to be a stock burger or an early right. morning DJ. Then the bottom lists are assets and liabilities or strengths and weaknesses. So you make lists of the things that you have that can be assets for you that you're, or, or your not only personality traits and if you have some money or if you have contacts or you have skills. And on the liability side, the things that might hold you back from succeeding. And now you've got what I call a personal balance sheet. From the top two lists, the, the right and the left, the likes and dislikes, mm -hmm. you set goals. You set you look around and say, what kind of work? I want, you, I want to build a career for you that services your life. Mm -hmm. So you find careers that maximize the likes and minimize the dislikes. You'll never get rid of all the dislikes. You'll never get to do all the likes. 
but if you can maximize the likes and minimize the dislikes, if you can use the things that you're passionate to do, and then use the assets and the liabilities to actually gain those goals. Gain the momentum. Yeah. You had a tremendous amount of personal success after 40. Ken is probably best known for creating We Are the World. Do you remember back in 1985 when they, you know, you yeah. pulled the team together? And I was 49 in 1985. 49. I hate to express <laughs> how old I am no. now, but the truth <laughs> of the matter is, I was 49. Uh, I also did Live Aid that year. Did a lot of the work on Live Aid, mm -hmm. and then a year later, at 50, I did uh, Hands Across America, which this jacket, by the way, kind of. Is that your Hands Across America jacket? Yeah, wow. red, red, white, and blue, and a lot of fun. And so uh, Hands Across America, for those that don't remember was a movement it was it was for charity right yeah uh, and i think it was 60 six, 65 six and a half million and a half people million holding people. hands from new york's battery park through 17 states in a continuous line all the way to the queen mary here in california um it literally was a continuous line that in the actual line about five and a half million and then in other parts of the world where they couldn't be in the the line they would do it like at military bases in San Francisco, we didn't go through the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. They went across the Golden Gate Bridge. Wow. There was a kid in Minnesota who organized a line across Minnesota. So how do you find the stamina at 50 years old to say, I'm going to organize a movement that is going to mobilize 6.5 million people to get together for a common cause? You know, when, when I started the year before with We Are the World, I literally felt uh, everything that had happened in my life up to then was preparatory mm -hmm. for being in the right place at the right time with the right skills and the right contacts to make this happen. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, so I've always believed everything that happens in life happens for a good reason. Mm -hmm. So even the bad things, you know, I, I teach people, you know, even the negatives can create positive from negatives, even mm -hmm. some of the most serious negatives you can. And uh, so I felt like I was in the perfect right time. Mm -hmm. And literally, I mean, in my 40s, in my 50s, and my 60s, quite frankly, I accomplished some of the greatest stuff that I've done. Yes, it's so, you know, and, and, and that's the thing is, because a lot of our viewers, you know, they're living life in their 40s and their 50s, even in their 60s and beyond, and what I get from a lot of people is, well, you know, I have a passion, I have some hobbies that I like, I made the mistake of not making it a career, and I think it's too late now. What would you say to someone who's 50 years old, 55, and, and, you know, just ha doesn't feel like they've tapped into their passion. Is it too late for them now? I don't think it's ever too late. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's ever too late. I'm, I'm still working, and I'm a lot older than 50 now. <laughs> and uh, I'm still having fun. I, mm -hmm. That's the big thing for me. I want to do stuff that excites me. I oh. want to get up in the morning and can hardly wait to get doing it. And, uh, and it's that back to that word passion. If there is a running theme today, it would be passion. And, um, but I want to be passionate about the stuff I do. I don't care what it is, mm. by the way. Now I'm a consultant and people come to me to help them with their businesses or particularly nonprofits mm -hmm. because of my background there. And I take on those that excite me where I think I can make some difference mm -hmm. and where it's fun, where I can really have a good time doing it. Well, and I think, you know, it, it's life is a balance. And I think it's unfortunate that people go through their whole life not having fun. Uh, we have a guest that's going to be joining us a little bit later in the program. We're going to have a nice conversation with him, Tom, um, Ken. His name is Tom Alexander. And Tom Alexander is another example, he's going to be sharing his story with us, of someone who has a passion, is living life after 40. <coughs> he is a, a composer, a musician. Uh, he's also a screenwriter. But he has a really interesting family history pertaining back to what we talked about earlier, which is the American dream. And he's going to share that with you, 110-year history in the entertainment sphere. We're going to get into that with him. But speaking of entertainment and speaking of successful careers, you had written a book. Yeah. It was called uh, Life is a Contact Sport. And you talked about the 10 greatest career strategies. What are some of those strategies? How does one cut through the static? Well, there are a couple. I think the thing, the biggest takeaway from that book, and from, and which is still available, you can get it on Amazon.com. I don't make a penny off it, but you can <laughs> buy it. For the funny thing is, I went there one day and I could buy one for a penny. They just charge you five or ten dollars to ship it to you. you know? That's funny. But it's there. It's uh, but uh, the principles, except for the fact that it was written before the internet and all of that, it was mm -hmm. written in the 90s. Uh, other than that, the principles work, and the most 
There are two that I can tell you about quickly that uh, really resonate with people. They come back to me years later and say, I've been using that, you know, and the biggest one is something called the magic of threes. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened was when I started, I, the book came out of a class I taught at UCLA, and when I started researching my work for that class as to what to teach people, mm -hmm. I went back through my whole career, which by that time had already been about 30 years. And I realized that every time I got somebody to take any kind of action, whether it was come to a concert of one of the acts I was managing or buy a record or, you know, or anything, anything, and not only in business life but in my personal life, mm -hmm. that it always took like three impressions to get people to take action. And the reason was that even in those days, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, we were still hit with so many different things. Now it's unbelievable. And you can't get anybody's attention unless you do something that's unique or special. Mm. It's gotta be have real substance to it. It has to have, if you get their attention, there has to be something they'll take action on. Mm. And then the third thing is unexpected. Now in my classes at UCLA, at that moment when I say unexpected, the UCLA marching band marches right through the class. <laughs> and I say, look, you know, now I have your attention. But more importantly, where is the marching band in every single thing you do? Every time you want to get something done, where is your version of a marching band? Think of it that way. Where are you going to get do something that's unique or special based on substance and unexpected? The unexpected part is critically important. And there are so many examples of this. I, I just give you a personal one because sure, it's so I'd much fun. Sure, I love a personal one, absolutely. The personal one it has to do with uh, Valentine's Day. Okay. On Valentine's Day, every year for many, many years, my wife, Kathy, who I've been married to now 39 years, but we would go to the same restaurant here in Los Angeles and have a table that we reserved for Valentine's Day every year. And uh, we would have a nice romantic two-person dinner at this rest. Very yeah, nice. Valentine's Day, yeah. Yeah. So I, um, this particular Valentine's Day, Trisha Yearwood was appearing in New York in Central Park, and I had to be there. So I left early that morning. But before, uh -oh. <laughs> during, the, during the week before, I, ha I got an entire basket of all kinds of cool stuff. We just had a kid, a young a daughter, and I got some stuff for her and stuff for my wife and put Valentine's Day cards Sweet. in there and left it in the front hall because I left way too early for anybody to be up. Aww. Okay. Uh, next thing I did is that afternoon I had the traditional roses and candy delivered to the house. They got it a bit screwed up, but she eventually got it, and that came with a card. And then that evening, she decided to go to the restaurant with a friend, not, not another guy, unfortunately, <laughs> with a girlfriend. And uh, I arranged to pick up the check, and I arranged to have a card delivered there and a bottle of champagne and two Good glasses. Guy, okay? Now, did she call when she got the basket? Well, I might have been on the plane at that time. And also, this is pre-cell phones. Did she call when she got the flowers and the candy in the afternoon? No. But when she got to the restaurant, the third thing, mm -hmm. she called me, she found a phone, she tracked me down in New York, she, in tears, she told me how much she loved me, how much she appreciated what I did for her. The magic of threes works everywhere. It works in your business, it works in your life, it works if you're in school, it works whatever you're doing. You can use the magic of threes by realizing that you don't use just one thing to get something accomplished, that you surround that one thing with at least two others. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if you're reaching out to a mass public, sure. you try to surround it like the movie studios do with 10 or 15 things, mm -hmm. because then you're trying to reach, recipients have to get three things. Mm -hmm. You've gotta get a lot out there for any one recipient to get three. To actually mobilize, yeah. right? And so you're talking billboards, you're talking paraphernalia. Whatever it is, whatever it is right. in your particular career and business, you wanna do that. Sure. Now that's yeah. number. That's the first thing you asked for. The right. other thing from my book uh -huh. that really resonates, this is the second thing that anybody mentions, is something I call how to get caught telling the truth, <laughs> which is basically the power of honesty. Mm. I have built an entire career and a reputation in my profession because I'm known to tell the truth mm. always. And to use that to disarm people at times because they don't expect it. We're in, a, we're in a society now, and I won't make any particular examples, where the truth is just not 
used by many people. Well, give, give me an example of where you used the truth and it worked in your favor. Because well, that sounds so simple. But yeah, it, do, it really does. Um, for example, I was, I was uh, years ago managing a wonderful artist named Harry Chapin. Mm -hmm. And after he passed away, um, we did a show of his music in Chicago mm -hmm. with the idea of taking it to Broadway. It was a live show. Uh, and um, we um, got into some financial trouble and lost a lot of money and never took it to Broadway. Okay. Uh, my partners in that came to me and threatened to sue me. Mm. I sat them down. I explained where I thought I had screwed up, but also where others involved had. And by the time they left, they were like partnering with me to go after the people that were really responsible. Because you were just honest because about what I happened. Because I was honest. And you took, but, you took yeah, ownership. I probably think, the right? biggest example of it I just thought of is sure. Uh, in 1990, I guess it was, uh, I had a, a clients, Trisha Yearwood, Travis Tritt, and Kenny Rogers, mm -hmm. and I, Trisha Yearwood was booked on Jay, one, Jay Leno's show for October, right. uh, and in June, Travis Tritt was coming to town to, to Arsenio Hall, which mm -hmm. was their competitor, and I got a call. I, I, I did, again, my magic of threes. I had the city with billboards and mm -hmm. advertisements in Variety and so on, all kinds of stuff. And it made it look like Tra Travis was much bigger than he was. <laughs> and I started getting calls from The Tonight Show. Okay. F and the various people that I knew on The Tonight Show, because I'd had a lot of acts on there over the sure. years, were saying the producer of The Tonight Show, Helen Kushnick, really wants Travis. You've got to get him off Arsenio and get him on The Tonight Show. And I mm -hmm. said, I can't do that. Yeah, I committed. So I got a call from her. And she said, you better do it or you'll never have another artist on this show. And she was much more graphic than that. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I said, look, I can't do it. I called the, I actually called Arsenio's booker and she said, look, she's been doing that with one act after another. Yeah, she's been really hurting trying to pull So I called back and said, no, I'm not going to do it. She hung up on me and immediately pulled Trisha Yearwood, which wasn't until oh, October. Oh, you joking. Yeah, and, that, and I, my next call was from the music editor, Robert Hilburn, from the Los Angeles Times. I, didn't pl I had placed a call to him because he had written a lovely article on Trisha. Okay. And I said, you won't believe what happened. Oh, no. And he said, uh, unreal, he said, we've been hearing these stories, but nobody will go public, will you? And I did. Oh, my. And within a week, oh. she'd not only lost her job as Jay Leno's manager, he fired her. Wow. Uh, and thanked me for years for it, uh, but she lost her position as executive wow. producer of the show. Now that was the reason I say I quote that under the honesty part, because the re she told one story mm -hmm. and I told another. Uh, it might not um, be unlike what's going on politically right now with the with our yeah with administration our, yeah. Uh, but and it was my word against hers. Mm -hmm. But I had years of being known for being honest. Mm. and they believed mine, printed what I said, absolutely quoted me to the letter, to the word. And I think integrity and honesty are so important. Critical, and business will Can't be the path to your door. Can't people be honest in Hollywood? I mean, clearly they can. You have been. Here's the thing. Right? How you know, remember I said there? you get people's attention by doing something that's unique or special. <laughs> you tell the truth. Okay? That, and so the, the dishonesty that abounds mm. makes the honest person unique or special, mm -hmm. makes them stand out. You're doing the unexpected nowadays by right. being totally honest. And so it fills all of those attention-getting right. things, the, the and, it brings, and it brings business to you, it brings relationships to you. Yeah. And it, it secures that foundation, as you said, if you're going to be in a career for 30 or 40 or 50 years, yeah. right? That's why you have been. Talk to me about something that um, you've been quoted on saying it's easier to accomplish the impossible than, than the ordinary. Yeah, and again, very interesting, they all tie back to that whole unique thing. Mm -hmm. When you're trying to accomplish something and you just set out to do what's been done before over and over again, even something I get calls every week, we are, let's redo We Are the World, let's redo Hands Across America. Once it's been done and accomplished and no longer clearly impossible, people don't talk about it. Now, they may say you're crazy, in fact, Lionel Richie used to say, as, as soon as they start saying you're crazy, you know you're going to be really successful. <laughs> uh, and the crazier they think you I are, like the that. more successful you're going to be. I love that. I have it on tape for my That's class. <laughs> he, uh, but anyway, uh, the fact of the matter is that when you set out to do the ordinary, you know, you know it. 
you look at it and you go, ho oh, hum, they've done that. I don't, right. You don't think about it twice. When you set out to do something that seems totally impossible, everybody's talking about it. Mm -hmm. Everybody is constantly, constantly talking about it. And uh, the more impossible it seems, the more they talk. Now, here's the interesting part of it, and I've experienced this over and over and over. Once you start to get a little traction, okay. once you begin to have a little bit of success, people jump on board to help you because huh. now they want to be part of history. Right. You get now they want to be part going. of, now it's exciting. They're for the underdog or they're for the unique. They want to be party to something that hasn't been done before. Well, I'm just going to go back to We Are the World for a minute just to put this in perspective for some people that may not know how incredibly successful that single became. You pulled together, you know, acts like Michael Jackson. You had Harry Belafonte involved, Quincy Jones. I mean, all the big talent at the time. That single, which you 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 made to uh, to combat African famine, right? right the the right. crisis, sixty three million dollars you made back then. Taking that in two thousand seventeen dollars, one hundred and thirty eight million dollars. Wow, I haven't ever done one that single. Yes, yeah. we did the calculations. One hundred and thirty eight million dollars off of one effort. Yeah. So big congratulations to you. Thank you. People thought you were probably crazy when you tried starting well, to there's do that. Well, <laughs> there's, there's another little unique point to that, and mm -hmm. that is I was getting ready to do, Bob Geldof had sort of been our inspiration. He did a song called Do You Know It's Christmas in England, and he raised about $10 million on the single ultimately. Mm -hmm. And Belafonte called me and said, we've got to do something here. And I said, let's do another record. Mm -hmm. uh, but what was really interesting is the president of one of the record companies said to me, don't just put a single out. Get unreleased tracks from each of these artists mm. and put an album together that has music you can't get anywhere Brand else. New, right? yeah. And that album became an absolute sensation, and we did $64 million. In fact, believe it or not, we still get revenue uh, this sh every year. We get a couple hundred thousand. We distribute probably more than half of that every year in grants, and we're now 32, 33 years into this we've always tried to close and we can't because money just keeps coming in for these wonderful projects so we fund african work and then with hands across america which we did a year and a half later uh we fund a lot of things in the in the u.s uh, a lot of so projects did you ever have anything go south because oh life goes up oh and God, down yes. right what yeah. happens <laughs> when it starts going south what, what character traits do you need to tap into to get through that? When I got a little bit of money, I became a big fan of antique cars. And Kenny Rogers gave me a 1928 um, Ford um, oh. convertible, uh, you know, a little Ford. Was it red? No, it wasn't red. It was brown, I think. But it was a Model A, I guess. But it had a rumble seat and the whole thing. Sure, it was pretty yeah. cool. I get a note on the thing one time, and it's from, and the guy says, we're doing a show in Las Vegas, and we need cars, mm -hmm. and can you, can we use your car? And they were recreating like a 1920s gang. It was okay. called the Duda Gang, and it became a sensation in L.A. They would, the gangs would have shootouts, fake shootouts around the, but they would be a 1920s gang, and they had a wedding where, the, and so on, and everything. Anyway, the show goes to Vegas. Okay. That was their ultimate thing. It becomes a Vegas show, and I produce it, but I'm not involved financially in okay. it. But they're short on money, so I take my savings and uh -oh. loan it to them for two days, and I never get it back. Oh, no. And the show goes bottoms up, <laughs> and we sneak out of Vegas. At, at midnight, <laughs> at midnight that night of the last show, we back a truck up to the back. We unload stuff. I had a piano that was there that was in my antique piano that was in my house for years. I had an, uh, an old touring limo, everything, and we snuck out of Vegas with it. <laughs> and sounds I, like it and sounds I lost like an my whole savings. Oh, it sounds yeah. like an episode of um, uh, what's it called? Hangover. Oh yeah, the Hangover. When all the guys were, were trekking out of Vegas, so you lose all your savings. You come back and you're feeling deflated. How do you get back on your feet? You know, I went to work briefly for a guy named uh, Jerry Weintraub, very mm -hmm. famous manager and then producer, uh, Ocean's Eleven, all that series of movies and other stuff. He did na a movie called Nashville first. Mm -hmm. uh, and I went to work for Jerry for just a year and a half, two years, a couple of years. But it got me really back on my feet. I wasn't earning a lot, but I was at least back in it. And then the Kenny Rogers came to me. I had been managing the first edition when they were together, but they'd mm -hmm. broken up. 
as a solo act. And uh, Jerry didn't want to sign him. He felt he was over. I signed him anyway. And How old was Kenny Rogers when you signed him at that point? Oh, gosh, it was probably about 1977 or okay. 8. We, he was probably, because uh, he's just Mid-30s a little bit younger. Maybe. May, yeah, maybe yeah. even in his 40s okay. at that point. He was okay. the oldest member of that group mm-hmm. of the first edition. And within a year, we had one hit record after another, and suddenly Kenny was bringing in $2 million a year. <laughs> and he came to me and said, I'm leaving because Jerry never believed me in the first place. Certainly he believed in him now because he was doing tremendously well. And he said, you can either come with me or not. And we did. And we set up our own management company. Mm -hmm. And I never have worked for anybody else since. Since then. If you're just tuning in, I'm sitting here today with um, Ken Cragen, who is one of the top talent managers that this city has ever seen, has managed the talents Mm -hmm. we were just talking about, uh, Kenny Rogers. Lionel Richie, you've worked with um, with uh, uh, Olivia Newton-John. How difficult is it working with talent who is not American? Was that a challenge at all? No, not at all. In fact, it was fun because I got to go with Olivia to Down Australia to do a TV special. Toured all over Tasmania and then all over uh, mm-hmm. Australia doing it, and it was just a blast. Plus, I was totally in love with Olivia at the time anyway. <laughs> I was married, so nothing uh, happened. But, 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 when, but everyone when, was. When they, yeah, when they... When her attorney brought her to me, I thought like my dreams had come true. <laughs> what a neat, neat lady. I she's going through some trouble now. She's having a little bit of trouble. We have our caller on the line. Oh, I think we just lost him. Oh, Tom, if you're calling, call us back one more time. I'm sorry. Oh, there we go. Sorry to interrupt you no, again. We're no. going to get to Tom, and we'll bring him in on this conversation. Hi, LA Talk Radio. Is this Tom? Yes. Hi, Tom. Welcome in. Hey, thank you for calling. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. We are just uh, sitting here with Ken Craig, and I'm sure you've been catching the first half of our show, and we're... Absolutely. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful stories. And, Such uh, great stories. I, I'm, just, I'm captivated by, by listening to uh, such, a, such a well-known mm-hmm. and admired oh. uh, person in this industry share so much of these... Uh, so uh, much of these great stories. Uh, abs- it, uh, absolutely. It, and, you know, with, with our theme today of, of living the American dream, just going back yeah. to Olivia Newton-John for just a moment, you know, this is someone mm-hmm. that wanted to live the American dream that wasn't even American. And that's going to lead me into <laughs> your family, Tom, because yeah. I'm going to give I'm going to give the viewers a quick snippet, and then I'll let you take it from there. So, Ken, listen to this yeah. story. Tom's grandfather came through Ellis Island at the turn of the century. And in 1906, he built and ran one of the first Nickelodeons in the country. This was in Pennsylvania. The the family now, four generations later, 110 years in the movie business in some aspect. So, Tom, that's pretty incredible. Yeah, you know, my grandfather, uh, unfortunately, I never got to meet him. He passed before I I was Mm -hmm. uh, born, before I had arrived on the planet. But uh, he, he was an inspiration uh, to me, and I've heard so many stories. And um, again, he started—you know—really started with with nothing. Came here from Greece, and and uh, was a candy maker initially. And then one thing led to another. And he saw an advertisement for a movie projector, an old hand cranked movie projector. And he partnered up with a man who would ultimately become his mm-hmm. his brother in law later, uh, as he married his, uh, his his sister, his, his partner, business partner, sister. And um, they together built uh, these little. Uh, little Nickelodeons, and then it became neighborhood theaters and movie palaces. And well, I grew up in the last one, I was, I, you uh, know, the very last one that he had built. Right. Um, I, I had gotten my very first job there and doing mm-hmm. everything from taking tickets and making popcorn to running the projectors. So I was going to say, that Ken, you probably remember those days. Well, you know, I was going to say, Tom, we have something in common. My great grandfather came mm-hmm. in 1852 across the Isthmus of Panama on a donkey, came from Austria or Poland, I'm not quite sure which one, and took a a steamer up to San Francisco and got there too late for the gold rush, so he opened the first furniture store in San Francisco. But I think there's a big lesson here because the fact is we all came here from somewhere else, and in a time when, when the whole, you know, immigration issue is such a big issue in this country, we have to yeah. l- remember that there's practically no one here, really almost no one here, who can't trace yeah. their their and, family and, and immigrating to America. Mm-hmm. Um, That's very true. Yeah, yeah. very true. And I, I was so inspired by all those stories, you know, from 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 people from all over 
everywhere, you know, and, um, you know, whether it be Europe or uh, wherever wherever they uh, came here from, uh, you know, and, and they all brought so many interesting uh, awesome. aspects of their right. own culture, which ultimately just kind of got folded into the what became the American culture. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's pretty, pretty cool. You How know? American? And, uh, your, your family, you mentioned, um, Tom, uh, you know, was from Greece originally, and I when I was doing a little reading, uh, your grandfather's name, you're actually named after him, was Tom Alexopoulos at the time, yeah. and they changed it right. to Tom Alexander. You know, when he came into the yeah. country. But how much of, of uh, the Americanism there with the Nickelodeons and the theater, how much did yeah. that affect your uh, wanting to move into the space of entertainment? I, you know, it, it's really probably everything because <laughs> it was all I, all I knew. Um, you know, I just saw um, uh, the passion for, uh, I guess what you could call the great experiment, which was America, right, to mm-hmm. kind of bring people from all over the world to form this um, uh, you know, new nation, uh, an evolving nation, and he was thrilled to to be an American and be part of this whole th- this whole thing, and yet maintain uh, a cultural identity to Greece. But um, and and so there's so many great stories. I, there, I'm always reminded of that scene in Godfather Two when when Vito Corleone first comes into Ellis Island and you see the Statue of Liberty in the background and the music swells and it's beautiful and you see all these different faces from all over the place. And they're coming through Ellis Island. And I always imagined my grandfather kind of coming through at that time, you know. Um, not too much older than Vito Corleone was at the right. time. I think he, I think when my grandfather got here, he was 15 or 16 right. years old, uh, as opposed to Vito being like nine. Right. But, you know, it was the same kind of a thing. And um, it just a it just great, great story. And, so, so, and everyone has those stories. I, it, um, I, I, when you, uh, you say know, it, though, when you say he's from Greece, I think of uh, my great big... Greek big, wedding, big, big you know, big Greek, big wedding. Back, <laughs> Greek wedding, and I wonder, you know, and how everything had Greek origins, uh, everything. <laughs> everything, of course. Yeah, Tom. well, if you talk to my... <laughs> If you talk to my family members, they'll they'll back that up. <laughs> I was going to say, Tom, they, how, ma- as how my many? Many, many of my uncle said everything come from the Greek. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, Tom, how many how many cousins do you have named Tom? Probably about thirty. Oh man, Tom, everybody in our family is either Tom or Peter. There you go, Tom and, Peter. Um, and, 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 and so you know, my son is Peter. My dad was Peter. <laughs> Uh, so there's a lot of a lot of Peters and Toms, in my in my family sure. in my in my family it's Nick and George because I've got Greek yeah, background Nick and George, as well. So George, Nick and George, absolutely. that's funny. <laughs> Talk to us a little bit, Tom, because you as well are an artist. And uh, going back to this life after forty, this is interesting, Ken. Uh-huh. Uh, one of the screenplays, your first screenplay, Tom, that you sold, you sold at the age of forty-four, and it was yep. the last film that Leslie Nielsen ever did. So how did it feel yeah. being in your 40s, trying to push this script and hoping somebody's going to pay attention? You know, it's really interesting. Um, you know, of course, at the time, we had no idea it would be uh, Leslie Nielsen's last film. Um, and sadly, of course, neither neither did he, but it, it wound up being that. Um, he kind of had to retire after that because he, he'd grown quite ill. But... Um, uh, it was it was amazing uh, to to have um, been asked to kind of come in and, and um, uh, co-write uh, this project and 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 it just sort of after kind of you know it's funny because it actually the, the pitch itself was not the film I had sort of been almost recruited uh, from previous scripts that I had written uh, about an idea that uh, a producer wanted to do. And they said, you know, his style of writing might be a good fit. So let's let's pair up two writers, and uh, let's see what we come up with. Well, <laughs> and and that's think, kind of how it works. And I was going so to say that goes back to almost a commission kind of a, a project. <laughs> no, but but that and that goes back to what Ken was saying a little bit earlier about the importance of teams, right? And, yeah. and having the right collaboration and the right people pulled yeah, together. Clearly, yeah. that works. No, no, no question. I mean, there are things that you um, would never think of. Uh, on your own, um, or you know, you're inspired. You're in the room, and and ideas start to to fly around. And it's like, wow, I just, I never would have come up with that. It's like being in the car with your best buddy, you know, and you're driving, and you start telling stories, and one thing leads to the next, and then you almost start riffing, you know, right. in the car. It's like, oh, and then then this happens, and then that happens, and then the and, light bulb um, goes off. Tom, exactly. I have a question. I have a question for you yeah. because we have, you know, a, a a man in the room here who has work yeah. with some of the musical greats you're a musician yeah. you have just released a new album called overbrook avenue 
Before we get yeah. to that, because um, we have a, a copy of one of your tracks, I want to ask Ken, in your opinion, and then I want Tom to answer, in your opinion, what, for a musician, is the number one characteristic that really drives their success? It goes back to the word unique. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to find what it is about what you do, mm -hmm. what's in your music, what's in, if you're a performer, what's in your personality, what is it that you uh, have that sets you apart? You know, I, I think that what serviced me my whole life um, has been this somehow gut understanding. Literally, when somebody walks in the room, whether they have that extra piece, mm -hmm. what is it about them? Sometimes it takes months for me to find it, uh, but sometimes it's automatic. The, the biggest stars, it's usually automatic. Mm -hmm. it, it, they, they have a presence in the room. Mm -hmm. The biggest ones who are performers. It's a little different with a musician. You have to hear the music and you have to see what's unique or about it, what's going to capture people's attention. Because again, they aren't going to buy it unless you get their attention. And I was going to say, speaking of <coughs> attention, Tom, you grew up in an age where a lot of music was going around. Who were your musical influences? How did you fall into music? Well, it, you know, it, it, uh, it evolved, but I would say the earliest influences were my dad and his youngest brother. Mm. Uh, my dad was a big, you know, classical music guy. Loved it. He wasn't a musician himself, but he he was a huge you know devotee of that music. And then his younger brother was a jazz pianist, mm -hmm. and we had a an old piano that was backstage, behind in our the theater that I grew up in. It was behind the screen. It was an old little upright Steinway. Ken can come and pick it up. And he was always back way. there playing. <laughs> and um, I'd go back there and listen to him, and he'd show me a thing or two, and that would evolve. But then, um, you know, I really took a real interest. One day that piano wound up in the basement of my home because I guess I had shown so much interest that they thought, well, let's take this, help this kid get to the next yeah, step. Give it to the kid, yeah. And so uh, that's what happened. But my biggest influences, I think, are, you know, I mean, I went through rock like every kid my age pretty much did and, and um, R&B and, and funk music mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff I love. Uh, still love my classical music, but then when I really kind of got into jazz and progressive music, people like Herbie Hancock and, and Chick Corea and um, Pat Moschini and those kinds of guys, I really found the music that really motivated me and inspired me to, to compose. Tell and, us a little uh, bit about. I was going to say, tell us a little bit about the track that we're going to play here for everyone, so they, they can get a sense of your music, yeah. Glimmer Glass. Glimmer Glass is the uh, lead track. It's the first track off my my new recording, Overbrook Avenue, which is a, a, the street where I grew up, mm -hmm. uh, just a, a couple towns away from where our theater was. And so it was very, um, uh, I think, evocative, you know, it, it, of that time, of the 70s, growing up. And um, this is a sort of a remembrance of, uh, remembrance of my mom, who had passed just before the album was completed mm. and um it was sort of dedicated to her and how she would love to look at the water and look out and right. just watch a, a still a still lake or something and we're going to play, that, kind of we're gonna play that track and um i'm sure yeah. you'll be feeling her and her memory uh this is tom alexander for you tuning in tom alexander is uh, an american writer broadcaster composer and musician we have uh, a sample track at glimmer glass from his new album overbrook avenue here we go We'll let it play a little bit. like I was living that I was saying that took me back to feeling like a sense of innocence did you get that yeah it's lovely it's beautiful really lovely did you compose oh, the whole thing thank you so much Tom I'm sorry can you say I didn't hear you oh I'm you sorry um, you composed all of it yeah yeah um, I, there's um, uh, there, I believe there are 11 tracks uh, off, off the album and, and 7 of them are original compositions including that one hmm. And um, it was, uh, you know, again, a, sort of a, a dedication to uh, to my mom. Yeah. And, you know, I think it just the goal here with this was to be as 
uh, the music, it's you know, all instrumental music to be kind of personal and cinematic mm. uh, and, and really cinematic. evocative, recalling childhood. I yes. think for anybody, you know, it, it, it may not be those exact memories. No one's going to have the exact same memory I'm going to have, but and I'm not going to have their memory. But I think it, it, it it's a place mm. musically where people can um, well, you know, identify. You, you, you can know, hear the jazz and the uh, classical influences in it, too. Right, absolutely. Yeah. And, and you yeah, know what's interesting, Ken, that Tom is doing is he's actually working now with his son, who is in Hollywood working in digital production. Tom, I think you were saying that you scored one of his uh, one of his films? Yeah, he's, he's a, 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 you know, an aspiring uh, filmmaker. Uh, he made uh, some films while, you know, he's still in college. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's uh, continuing, and he's always writing. And uh, I, he said to me about, uh, oh, two weeks before he wanted to debut his film, hey, Dad, will you score this for me? <laughs> and you said, oh, I guess I, said, I must. Uh, it's yeah, another, it's another thing we have in common. I, I have a daughter who's a filmmaker. She, along with her boyfriend, have a film company. In fact, they left this morning to... Uh, work on a feature that they're doing in uh, Tennessee uh, and yeah. she's only a few years out of uh, UCLA's film school mm -hmm. um, yeah. but but uh, we have that very very much in common and it's great when you can work with your son on something like that. A I think. Absolutely. Tom you know, I, I also mm -hmm. I think I recall that you mentioned Herbie Hancock being an influence on you and he's a very very dear friend of mine one of my uh, closest friends. Well Herbie Herbie is uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I, I jokingly call Herbie, you know, if you fly Delta, you, you eventually have to go through Atlanta, you know? That's sort of like Herbie, because <laughs> if you play jazz piano, you eventually have to go through Herbie Hancock. <laughs> he, yeah, it, he, he, he really is uh, one of those guys that you just cannot, uh, you cannot go around. Yeah. He's, he's such a great, great artist. Tom, before we leave you, let us know how we can get a hold of your album. Where can people go to find you? Well, thank you. Yeah, it's on, it's available pretty much across the uh, digital music spectrum. You can go to iTunes and just look up uh, Tom Alexander, uh, Overbrook Avenue. Awesome. And uh, spells exactly like it sounds. Overbrook is one word, Overbrook. And uh, just uh, type it in, and, and uh, you can download it there. Uh, you can download individual tracks to the whole, uh, the whole uh, album. What, so, what's um, next for you, Tom, in the next 10 years? Where do you see yourself going? Oh, boy. Well, I, I certainly think continuing this, I hopefully collaborating more with my son on film projects and scoring. Uh, I got a, I've got a band album, kind of a jazz fusion band album coming out later this year. Mm -hmm. um, and just continuing the process of, uh, of, of music and movies. And finally, to tell my grandfather's story. I've been finishing up a book on that and, uh, it, and, and how it all started for the whole family. Right. Right. Uh, about a teenage boy coming here from Greece, working in a chocolate shop, and then building a Nickelodeon, and and here we are, 110 years later, right. uh, sitting alongside my son making a movie and talking to two wonderful people on LA 40 <laughs> about it. Um, you know, it's, 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 and it goes uh, right back to that American dream, and uh, yeah, and and, and yeah. really being aware of the fact that it's the uh, the mix of cultures and people that really move this country forward that I believe is going to continue to move this country forward irrespective of you know too. other people's beliefs. Tom, we have to let you yeah. go. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Katerina. Thank you very much uh, 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 so much for letting me join uh, uh, Mr. Craig and I uh, today on the show it was wonderful. Well, let me know, Tom. Keep keeping the loop with me on uh, on the finalization of your book when it's ready and and uh, publicly circulating. I would love to have you on uh, my second program where we interview authors to delve really deep into your grandfather's story. But we'll leave that oh, for another time. Great, great to talk I to you, will. Tom. Take care, Tom. Thanks. You too, sir. Thank you so much. Be B well. Bye bye. bye, -bye. So there you go, Ken. Uh, you know, an <laughs> inspiring, inspiring story yeah. of. Somebody that came here with a dream and whose family is continuing the legacy. Yeah, it's great. It's yeah. a terrific story. And it's funny, you asked him what he looks for for the next 10 years. Somebody asked me not too long ago now what, my, what was on my bucket list still. Mm -hmm. And I said, God, I've had this career and this life that I can hardly think of anything more you could make out of it or do. And then I said, but you know what? My bucket list, the big thing on my bucket list is live long enough to see my daughter win an Academy Award. Because <laughs> I've got a filmmaker daughter, I too. I love <laughs> that. Well, we'll, we'll, push, uh, we'll push some good energy her way. Yeah. Ken, question for you. If you had to talk to your 40-year-old self, what would you tell him? Be passionate about everything you continue to do. Just stay that course. Right. Um, 
and you're totally correct in believing somewhere, and I'm sure my parents were the ones that installed this or instilled me with this, uh, that be remember that everything that happens in your life, even the most unpleasant things, mm. happens for a good reason, and you can build on it in some way or other. You know, I, I, I think of the terrible tragedy that happened to the women who lost their children to drunk drivers, and yet they took it and created MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, and saved millions of lives. Mm. And so the worst tragedy you could possibly have uh, literally, other than your own death, probably is is the that, death of a child. and yet they they found something positive in it to keep that memory mm-hmm. going. And I've seen a number of other people who uh, have done that with various losses. Uh, that isn't the only one. I mean, the whole home shopping network was built on uh, an advertiser not paying his bills and the <laughs> and the station taking the product and putting it on the air and well, and it goes back it. to yeah. what you were saying earlier, which is you know the unexpected. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and you've also talked about backward motion for forward movement, or backward thinking for forward motion. Yeah, it's, it, I don't know that we have enough time to get into that thoroughly here, but basically that concept is where you look at the end result and realize that it's going to take a whole bunch of people for you to get there, that you've got to get through a lot of gates, and the people that control those gates are gatekeepers. And you want to start at the end result, figure out who the gatekeepers are, Mm. make a list of them, work backwards, then learn everything you can about them and what might lead them to a positive decision. Look at your list. Remember, we did the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. Look at your list of your assets. Where can you utilize those? On the liability side, what's holding you back from getting through those gates? Mm -hmm. And then you have a roadmap once you've done that to go forward through those gates and get to your ultimate goal. But you do it by getting a bunch of people along the way to say yes to you, your product, your, you know, your service, mm. uh, whatever it is. You have had such an illustrious career. What would you like your legacy to be? Do you feel you've left one? I think to a great extent I have. I, I feel very strongly about that, but that, uh, uh, that he did good for a lot of people. I think that's probably it. I think it's very possible to do good for a lot of people and still have success in business and still have success in Hollywood and entertainment. For as much as people tell you you have to be cutthroat and you need to be sneaky and you need to, you know, kill the underdog, uh, you are clearly an example of the opposite of that. Well, we are the world, and Hands Across America cost me about $2 million in business at Mm -hmm. the time. Nothing has done better for me since than what I gained by doing those mm-hmm. projects. So what looked uh, like you know, an opportunity uh, cost at the time. Monetarily, mm-hmm. emotionally, fulfillment of life dreams, everything was serviced by doing something uh, you know, for other people without looking to get anything back. That's okay. another thing right, I right. talk about. Closing thoughts, <coughs> Ken, on this 4th of July week living the American dream and also uh, our life, living life after 40 audience. Any thoughts, any closing remarks you'd like to well, leave the us with? Well, Ju- you know, the 4th of July is all about celebration. Mm-hmm. It's also about, you know, big pyrotechnics. <laughs> 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 you know. Get me up all night. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, so it has a lot of lessons for us. It, it goes back to being passionate. I think that's the theme that runs through everything. Mm-hmm. And it goes uh, back to celebrating your, your life every day. I, I literally get up every day now and say thank you that I'm here and I'm healthy and I'm having fun and I'm still active as can be. Ken Craig, and we thank you so very much for your time today, sir. Thank you. It was a pleasure having you here. Uh, you can find out more about Ken at KenCraigan.com. You make it nice and easy. <laughs> and uh, for I'm sure for any of the students that you have had over the years, they have been incredibly lucky to have had you as an instructor. Well, I'm lucky too. You learn more as a teacher than you do from your students than they learn from you. Yeah, I like that. And we thank you for learning with us because we're here to learn and share and grow at LA40. I'm your host, Katerina Kazayas. Thank you for being with us. We will see you again next Thursday. Have a great week. Bye-bye. You're listening to LA40 with Katerina Kozias only on LA Talk Radio.